Good afternoon. I am uh, giving a talk today uh, for um, the heart failure service on um, PT in heart failure. Here you can see the schematic of a clinical course of a heart failure patient, uh, which obviously starts, as you know, with uh, left ventricular dysfunction, which may be symptomatic. Uh, then uh, patient develops symptomatic heart failure. At any given time, they may develop sudden cardiac death. That's usually more common before the heart failure decompensation and before the pump uh, failure occurs. But to be clear, it can happen at any time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about ventricular tachycardia in the setting of structural heart disease and particularly heart failure. <clears throat> ventricular tachycardia in the setting of, of structural heart disease is most commonly caused by scar-related reentry. Most commonly in ischemic heart disease, you have a uh, myocardial scar from a previous myocardial infarction. And because their scar is not completely homogeneously fibrotic tissue, you have strands of viable tissue mixed with the scar tissue. That leads to reentrant circuits. And usually more than one uh, reentrant circuit is possible within the scar. They tend to be one or two clinically dominant morphologies of the VT. And there may be a whole range of uh, fast and slow, rapid and stable, and polymorph polymorphic VT and ventricular fibrillation as well, as I will discuss later. Typical presentation is multiple ICD shocks, uh, whether they are in VT storm or not, that depends on just uh, arbitrary quantification. Um, how do we treat VT in the setting of, con of, of congestive heart failure? A few words about antiremic drugs. To take, the take-home take message is very simple. They don't work. Class one drugs, as tested in several studies, the CASH study, a cardiac arrest study in Hamburg, CAST study, and IMPACT studied um, class one drugs, the first one, propafenone versus um, metoprolol or amiodarone. That uh, showed that propafenone had increased mortality uh, <clears throat> compared to amiodarone or ICD um, implants. Class one drugs, uh, the flecainide, enconide, and morizacin, all of them increased mortality compared to placebo. And so did mexilatin. So class one drugs are out. Class two drugs, if you consider beta blockers and antiarrhythmics, as you know better than I do, uh, are, are part of the essential treatment of congestive heart failure. All of them have improved uh, mortality. And in some, ex in some of them, uh, they have some reduction in sudden cardiac death as well. So those are not part of the uh, question. You always are going to be treating patients with heart failure with beta blockers as tolerated. In terms of class three drugs, um, there's a lot of trials that have uh, tested uh, different drugs. The most commonly tested is amiodarone, which is either neutral um, or basically reduces, anti that reduces mort uh, mortality from arrhythmias and VT, but it doesn't improve mortality. So something about it, uh, even though it's a good antiarrhythmic drug, there's something about it that makes it uh, either um, uh, mortality neutral or in some cases may increase. And in some other studies, it may decrease, particularly non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. A few words about uh, dronedarone, <clears throat> the Andromeda study. It showed increased mortality as well as arrhythmic dress in the treatment arm. So dronedarone is out. Amiodarone, like I said, either neutral mortality uh, or, no, or, or in some cases improved in the case of uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, Desorolol also increases mortality. So take home message, only amiodarone, and not to save lives, but to reduce uh, arrhythmic death. And that's what we can say about um, antiarrhythmic drugs. In general, these patients need to have defibrillators, obviously. This is a must in patients with uh, decreased ejection fraction. Not to treat ventricular tachycardia, but to prevent sudden cardiac death. Compared to uh, placebo, ICD therapies uh, have less mortality. Compared to amiodarone, have less mortality. <laughs> so you have to have the background of an ICD in this patient. Now, the problem is, uh, is, uh, is implanting an ICD the end of a story? And it's not because um, <clears throat> even when you get an ICD, if the ICD works and saves your life, the presence of an ICD shock can increase mortality. And this is data from a study in 2018 in the New England Journal. 
showing that more than one appropriate shock versus no appropriate shocks had about five-fold increased mortality. Even inappropriate shocks uh, double the mortality. And if you have both, mortality is up to 11 times uh, the rate of those who do not have shocks. <laughs> Here you can compare, you can see the comparison between appropriate versus no appropriate shocks um, and different combinations of testing. The bottom line is that if, if the device saves your life and does what it's supposed to do, you know you're alive, but your prognosis is worse. Um, kind of, uh, it's kind of self-explanatory. You, you are more likely to have complications in the course of the heart failure uh, clinical um, evolution. Um, inappropriate shocks may improve, may increase mortality simply because of the damage created by the shock. Uh, it's known that ICD shocks can create some degree of myocardial injury through electroporation. Most of the time, these recover spontaneously, but nevertheless, inappropriate shocks have an increased mortality. Um, there's a plethora of, of uh, um, combination studies looking at the effect of um, certain drugs uh, in the background of an ICD therapy. Uh, perhaps I should mention the Pacifico study, which was, was led by Pacifico here at Methodist that showed that Sotolol can decrease uh, all-cause all cause death and ICD shocks in patients that have already an ICD. This is in contrast to the SWORD study that showed increased mortality um, in the Sotolol arm compared to placebo. Therefore, in the background of a, of a prior ICD implant, it can be helpful. We use it occasionally just to decrease the ICD shocks. Um, that's basically uh, the role of, of uh, antiarrhythmic therapies. Azimilide was tested in a couple of studies. I think Dr. Pratt was part of those. Um, it still pulled out of the market anyway. It did decrease the number of ICD shocks, but without, without significant effect in mortality. So um, I did want to give the heart failure team a, a brief taste of what we do in the AP lab when we deal with VT ablation, so you guys know what we're talking about. And the, and the idea here, when we take patients with VT <coughs> for ablation, we're taking a mechanistic approach. And, and this slide illustrates um, how, we, how we approach VT and how we understand VT in order to approach it with a catheter ablation. So VT is caused by scar tissue that has strands of viable muscle mixed within the scar. So this is scar tissue, this is scar tissue, and then scar tissue here. And you see this schematic showing this drawing where you have muscle mixed with scar. This muscle can conduct electricity, albeit not normally, but it can. It conducts electricity very slowly. And when you go into ventricular tachycardia, what happens is electricity goes through this isthmus of strands of myocytes within the scar tissue because it's, it, this is not normal muscle. The conduction is slow and you don't see it on the electrogram. When electricity exits the scar, that's when the QRS starts, that's systole. Electricity goes around the healthy muscle, gives you the QRS and then re-enters the scar through another spot. And then you go into the isthmus again during the diastolic component of uh, the circuit. So this, this should, make, should make it obvious that what we are looking for in a patient that has VT is we're looking for signals in diastole, like this one, because that illustrates that we, we may be in this. Now, the architecture of a scar is very complex. You may have an excitable tissue with different paths within the scar. And uh, you, may, you may have diastolic signals everywhere within these paths. Not all of them are part of the tachycardia circuit. There's, so there's a whole range of different techniques to, to figure out whether you are in a critical component of the tachycardia circuit or not. And this was, this is, this is the, you know, this is the, the, the content of a whole uh, discipline within EP and train main maneuvers to diagnose you know, whether you're in a blind loop, in the centralismus, or in an inner loop. Um, the bottom line is uh, you want to ablate uh, the areas within the scar that harbor signals during diastole. So there's a few different maneuvers that I'm not gonna um, really go into details, um, but um, 
Uh, this is something that we pretty much emphasize that the fellows need to understand. There's a few things that are kind of cute that I like to mention. So when you when you are in the diastolic component, you see this, for example, this signal here in, in between QRSs, and you pace it. You may actually create local capture of that portion of myocardium. You don't have a QRS after this pacing spike. You see this pacing spike? You see this signal here that is bringing this, this signal earlier than it was. You make that port of, portion of the scar tissue refractory, it's no longer available uh, for a tachycardia circuit and you terminate the tachycardia. That's one of the things that we like to see. And, but the truth is that um, we need and we have tools to identify the VT substrate uh, in VT without having to be in VT, in sinus rhythm or pace rhythm. And how so? Well, there's a few techniques. The oldest one uh, proposed uh, in, 2000, in the year 2000 by Martinsky is basically you measure the voltage size. You measure the voltage amplitude in different parts of the heart. And this is, uh, this is one patient this is the, the crude mapping system that was available 20 years ago. It's kind of uh, awful compared to the current standards, but you see uh, the, if the base is here, this is the mitral annulus, this is the apex, you have these red areas that are uh, color coding uh, for low bipolar voltage. And these red areas are the scar. And by simply measuring the bipolar voltage, um, you can get an idea of where the scar is. And by the way, this is the same technique that we use uh, to uh, map scar when we do EP guided biopsies. We have fancier maps, but the, the principle is the same. We look at areas of low voltage and we know that those are abnormal and those are scar. Now, there's been argument in, in the EP community as to what constitute low voltage. And the truth is that you want to kind of tier your voltage um, uh, settings so you can see not just a dense scar in this patient with, uh, again, this is the mitral annulus, this was the apex, and you have an inferior uh, scar here. If you use the standard voltage settings, it all appears to be scar, but if you tweak the voltage settings, you can actually see there may be uh, an area with slightly higher voltage going through the scar that could, may constitute the diastolic component of a, of a tachycardia circuit. We also have different tricks to identify uh, SCAR based on late potentials. So, and late potentials like this one may be more or less obvious depending on whether you're pacing or you're in, in, in normal rhythm using the intrinsic conduction system. The bottom line is that <clears throat> late potentials indicate slow conduction into that area. And that is not normal in normal myocardium and that with some judgment applied, obviously, may indicate a substrate for an tachycardia. Um, a few things about the late potentials. Obviously, these late potentials may be unmasked by pacing. And in this, in this example, they're showing you how you're, 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 they're pacing the myocardium. You see this late potential uh, during pacing, and then the tachycardia follows the pacing, and you see that the late potential matches a diastolic component of the circuit. Uh, pace mapping is something uh, we also do. So once we map the scar, if we want to figure out where in the scar is the, is the exit point of the tachycardia, we pace along the border. And if we get a QRS that matches the tachycardia, we know that that's in the neighborhood at least of the exit point of the scar. And if you pace from that edge of the scar deep towards in deeper sites inside the scar, you will get longer uh, stimulus to QRS delays that kind of match the tachycardia circuit. Um, it's tricky. Uh, pace mapping uh, can can have a lot of uh, pitfalls because depending on how how much amplitude you you use to pace, you may capture different exit sites. And like I said, tachycardia circuits are usually scar with multiple channels of, of uh, myocardial fibers that conduct electricity and more than one exit point may be uh, present. So depending on how much amplitude you use to page, you may get a stimulus followed by a short uh, delay and then the QRS. Or if you lower the output, you may get stimulus and a longer delay and then another QRS. In this case, what they're illustrating is if you give a big 
a big uh, pacing amplitude a pulse, you may capture this exit point and then lead to one QRS, but if you lower the output, you may not capture the enemy. Have to, electricity may have to travel through this other pathway and give you a different QRS. Uh, these are different pitfalls. Uh, the bottom line is that pace mapping is another technique. Uh, lately, a concept called lava, local abnormal ventricular activations have been, have been described, which is nothing than complex and delayed potentials in the areas uh, of the scar tissue. And those constitute abnormal uh, conduction that may be a substrate for tachycardia. Not necessarily prove anything, but just maybe a tachycardia. And we have different ways to unmask them, unmask them by pacing. These are technical details you probably don't need to know. And as we get more sophisticated, we have better tools. We have different catheters that can, can collect signals that, that 20 years ago with the ablation catheter you would miss. So these are signals collected from the same location using a two uh, bipolar catheter versus a 20 bipolar catheter. And you see how uh, you can see signals that are clearly abnormal that you wouldn't see with the standard ablation catheter. Unipolar mapping is a technique we use to find a scar typically in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy that may have a mid-myocardial or an epicardial substrate. Um, and we have different tools to map propagation within normal rhythm in, inside the scar. And this is just one example of how we can tweak our system to show how electricity gets into a scar. So this is a voltage map. This is extensive scar in this tissue, epicardial, more than endocardial, so this is probably non-ischemic. And when you do this uh, uh, mapping with the late isochronal annotation uh, technique, you can see how electricity goes very, very late and very slow into certain areas of the scar. And you can, you can delineate how electricity gets uh, into the scar during sinus rhythm, and that may be useful information to be able to ablate without having to induce VT. As we get better, we can get fancier uh, signals with more, more, uh, <clears throat> more electrodes that are smaller, that have um, higher fidelity signals. So the, the, the field has improved in terms of the technology over the past 20 years dramatically. In terms of our understanding, we are actually basically stuck with the same concepts that uh, Bill Stevenson came up with in, in 1993. Bottom line is, um, we identify the scar, we identify the substrate, we map the voltage and we annotate the late potentials and all those complex uh, signals as I described. Then we need to come up with an ablation strategy. And there's different ablation strategies. And we don't always use the same thing. And there's overlapping between the different strategies. But uh, here is a list of what we do. Uh, border zone ablation is basically Ablating, if you have a scar like this, you ablate around the edge so that you prevent anything from entering, anything from exiting. That's an empiric ablation tool that it, it can be done in sinus because you identify the scar in sinus and it can be very effective. With linear lesions, uh, sometimes linear lesions from the edge to the center of the scar, you map the late potentials, you ablate, you can do a limited uh, ablation depending on how extensive the scar is. There are patients that have massive scars if you have a massive scar, you cannot ablate it all. So you may just choose to do pace map along the edges of the scar and only the spots that gives you a good pace map that matches the tachycardia is where you ablate. That minimalistic approach probably doesn't work. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about other approaches. So the linear lesions come connecting the, the pace map sites to the end scar was one of the first uh, uh, approaches published by Martlinsky again in the year 2000. <clears throat> depending on, on how big the scar is. If it's too big, you want to do that. If the, if the scar is reasonably small, you want to do linear lesions along the edge of the scar where the voltage goes from normal to abnormal to prevent all exit paths into the scar and, and prevent all entrance paths into the scar. So you eliminate the car seconds that way. The pace mapping uh, approach was validated by Vivek Reddy um, 13 years ago, and he showed <clears throat> that in patients that had ICDs and ICD therapies, an ablation approach better than uh, antiarrhythmics led to improved survival from ICD therapies and ICD shocks. Uh, and the idea was find the scar, this red area, pace on the edge, the area that gives you so the point in the edge of the scar that gives you a good pace map, you ablate and you make a line to the core of the scar, the idea is to burn the exit paths. 
More recently, uh, more aggressive approaches have been proposed. Uh, this is by Natale, where he run, he took patients and randomized them to a limited subtrait ablation, as just described, versus an epicardial and endocardial homogenization. The idea is you burn in the inside of the scar and the outside of the scar. You sandwich the myocardium with burns from the inside, burn from the outside, and that led to better long-term results. Um, there are some endpoints that we like to have. Core isolation is one of those. The idea is that we want to see that the scar, it's either unexcitable or that when it beats, it cannot spread to the rest of the myocardium. So this is one example. They are burning. You see this little potential here is a late potential into the scar and then it's gone, consistent with electrical entrance block into the scar. And then that, that potential can actually beat desynchronized from sinus. So this, you can show that it is not, uh, is dissociated from the, from the rest of the myocardium. And it, actually you can pace the scar and it doesn't lead to a PVC. So you can see here, you, you pace, you get an activation within the scar and the patient remains in sinus. This, this endpoint has been associated with better outcomes. Another approach which is very similar in concept is to map uh, areas that have late potentials, uh, they call channels within the, VT, the VT substrate, and then ablate them to create what's called the channeling. And so you wanna make sure you have nothing, no late potentials like this. And when you have that again, you have uh, a better event-free survival. These are just more than different strategies. I see them as endpoints. What we know is that <clears throat> overall, if you look at different studies and you look at Extensive, you divide them as extensive ablation versus conservative approach. And you divide them as early in the course versus late in the course. It seems like with extensive ablation, you get less recurrence compared to uh, more um, aggressive ablation. So, so more conservative ablation. So these are recurrence overall conservative approach. You get this kind of recurrence if you look at uh, Extensive subtrain modification, you get much less, a 38% reduction. Again, this is not a randomized study. This is just a bunch of studies put together. There's a lot of areas for improvement in VT ablation. We like to have better <clears throat> delineation of the ablation targets, perhaps allow us to do a less aggressive approach because the more you burn, the more risk you get into you. There's risk of having clots in the catheter, there's risk of what we call steam pops, where you boil blood, you create these craters in the myocardium that can lead to perforation. There's a, there's a lot of damage to the myocardium. In general, you ablate only, only sick tissue, but there's patients that go into an inflammatory response, having like a, what Jerry Istep used to call vasoplegia, and, and we can get in trouble with that. Um, there's uh, a questionable need, uh, or the question is how, how to implement hemodynamic support. As you know, we use Impella, every now and then, particularly in patients that we want to keep in VT so we can map them. And VT obviously is harmful for the patient hemodynamically. And um, every now and then we'll use Impella, sometimes we use Tandem Heart, sometimes we could do ECMO. In terms of ablation technologies, I'll mention a few of the technologies that we have available. And it also, it's unclear what the optimal timing of ablation in the course of someone with heart failure is, and this is something that we discuss all the time with the heart failure people. You guys, I admit someone with some heart failure and incessant VT, we want to ablate, you want to transplant. There's always this that kind of uh, uh, give and take uh, between us, but the bottom line is that we, we need to discuss because we don't have a clear approach that we can implement on everybody. I mentioned a few words about MRI. Yes, there's studies looking at correlation between the MRI delineated scar and then the voltage. Uh, we do this all the time for biopsies. The correlation is, is obviously there, but it's so-so in terms of the spatial uh, matching and the sizing. And then uh, the clinical utility is not quite there. We don't take MRI maps and do not, those do not replace a regular voltage map. I wanted to show you some examples of the work we do. This is one case done last week, a patient with um, a pretty significant anteroceptal scar. This is, this is the aortic valve. We're looking at the heart kind of from above. This is, and from an RAO view, this is the septum. Red is scar. We see a bunch of areas of late potentials that were marked here. These blue dots were marked as late potentials. The patient had a slow VT, so we were able to map it and we can reconstruct the propagation pattern. And this is the, the 
propagation pattern. Electricity exits this car here. The QRS starts here, then it goes into the diastolic component, which is mostly concentrated in these areas of slow conduction that match the areas of late potentials during sinus rhythm. So it's a nice demonstration that this idea of mapping during sinus can, can lead you to identify the VT substrate without uh, having to keep the patient in VT. In this case, we kept the patient in VT and we got a nice movie to show you. Um, this is another case, a patient with also an, a large, this one was posterior septal infarct. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we, this guy had ablated, been ablated three times and I still VT. I don't have the voltage map here. I just show you the propagation. Uh, this, this arrows can get confusing. But basically, electricity was going around the base of the heart. This is the mitral valve, going around in a clockwise fashion, looking at it from the base and spinning. This is the aortic valve, the automatic continuity will be here. And electricity would go through the septum, anterior to the mitral valve, get into the septum, and then exit at the base of the, of the left ventricle. And we ended up ablating septally and also from the cornea sinus to take care of this, this little isthmus of conduction. So, um, is mapping worthwhile? The truth is there was a study comparing just mapping the substrate and burning the substrate based on late potentials versus putting the patient in VT and mapping only the components of the circuit that, that were part of the VT. And the truth is that if you do a substrate-based ablation, the recurrence is less than if you just do a clinical VT ablation. So we tend to be aggressive uh, as much as we can uh, safely. So, so um, a few words about our own work in this field. We've been interested in, in mapping the veins as a kind of a, a poor man's epicardial access. This is one example where uh, we had map the substrate in the left ventricle. This red area is our scar. I had ablated the hell out of it endocardially, and you can see those dots are ablation. <clears throat> the patient still had VT exiting the scar, and the red, red is early, red is here. So the exit point was here, but as you can see in the endocardial map, it exited there, and then I could not see anything else because all this was silent. The endocardium had been ablated before and this was uh, no signals here. But if I map the veins, I can actually construct the some of the diastolic component of uh, the circuit. And you can see how basically electricity exits the scar here, then goes epicardially, mapped through the vein. It's not like the vein, the vein has no myocardium, but the vein is a window to the my underlying myocardium in the epicardial aspect. And you can see how we complete the circuit and lay test is here and electricity probably got through epicardial layers and exited here again. So venous mapping is something we've been doing, not just for mapping, but uh, <clears throat> for ablation. This is one of our combined our shared patients with the heart failure team. This is a patient with an LVAD. The LVAD is this yellow thing that we make part of our map, big, big inferior scar with a nice vein on the epicardial aspect of the, of the scar. We had ablated extensively the endocardium and the still patient had VT. We were able then to map this vein, which was massive. As you can see here, this is a massive vein. This is the LVAD cannula. And we were able to show that the vein had signals consistent with the tachycardia circuit. In order to ablate massively this area, and of course, with an LVAD, we have kind of carte blanche, um, we basically put this technique of double balloon. We put a balloon proximal and a balloon distal. We occlude both. We inflate both and occlude the vein in both sides, and then we inject alcohol through the proximal one so that alcohol goes around the neighboring myocardium. Then we deflate the balloons and we move them slightly more distal. This is balloon two, balloon one, and these are branches of the vein here, and then we give alcohol. Then we move the balloons. And in the end, we have a nice epicardial lesion that we can actually see by echogenicity in the um, intracardiac echo. Uh, what about VF? Patients that don't have VT, but they present with recurrent shocks to, uh, for VF. So a few words about that. VF is obviously a terminal event in the heart failure decompensation, and it may not be something we want to deal with. Um, but it may be, a may be caused by electrolyte imbalance or acute ischemia in patients with some coronary artery disease. 
there are a few, there are a couple of scenarios that I want you to be aware of because those may benefit from an EP intervention. <clears throat> One is PVC induced. If you have someone that goes into VF and they happen to always have the same morphology PVC setting of VF, we have a role to play there because we can map the PVC and ablate the PVC and that has been shown to decrease VF episodes. In patients that have a, a previous uh, scar, particularly septal, particularly close to the fascicles next to Purkinje fibers, it's very common to have Purkinje ectopy leading to VF and those also can be ablated and respond to a substrate beta based ablation. Um, so those can be ablated and that's a key take home message that I wanna uh, uh, convey today. A few words about <coughs> other therapies. So particularly for, for uh, VF, or polymorphic VT or incessant VT that we cannot ablate anymore, <coughs> we have been exploring this approach of sympathetic blockade. Sympathetic blockade obviously is with beta blockers has been around for a long time, but a more, more aggressive blockade or more specific cardiac sympathetic blockade can be achieved by injection of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, anesthetic agents in the stellate ganglion. And this is a technique that we kind of uh, master now, uh, percutaneously using ultrasound guidance, we can find the stellate ganglion underneath the carotid and we can inject um, typically a long acting uh, version of lidocaine, bupivacaine, and we can achieve reduction in ICD shocks. So when, when, when the ablation cannot be done or has been done and doesn't respond, we can actually achieve a uh, control of the arrhythmia using stellate ganglion blockade. And when it works, obviously with the anesthetic, it lasts only a few days. Um, but we have uh, a couple of cases where we've worked with Dr. Chihara in, in thoracic surgery to achieve a surgical uh, block by removing with a, uh, with a robotic uh, uh, video thoracoscopic approach, uh, resecting the bottom half of the stellate ganglion can achieve selective cardiac uh, sympathetic denervation. So um, I mentioned earlier, and I think I'll stop here just the areas that we went need to do a better job. Um, I hope I gave you an, a good overview of um, what we do in VT ablation in heart failure patients, and I hope we can continue to work together. Thank you very much.